History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 463rd episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I'm your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we have a location suggested by our listener, Riley Berkman. I had never heard of this hotel, the Blenner Hassett Hotel. It's in West Virginia, and I can't believe we haven't heard of it because this thing is loaded with spirits. Oh, very cool. Looking forward to it. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, and it has a few spirits there. And then I started looking at stories and I was like, and there's another one and another one and another one. There's probably over a dozen spirits here. And I believe in 2023, they're going to have the inaugural Appalachian Paracon hosted there. Oh, very cool. So this is a hotel that embraces all the weird and creepy. So that's a plus in our book. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spectacular crew, Joanne, Tyra. This is the second Tyra in two weeks. That's pretty unusual. It is. I I was like, I was asking Kelly earlier, I'm like, didn't we already welcome Tyra in? And then I went, wait, we have another one. Christy, who spells her name with a K and an I-E, Rebecca, Abigail, and Courtney. Thank you so much for joining us on our Facebook group. And now this moment, Noddity. Some of us may find surgery-based television shows fascinating. Others of us may cringe at the sight of a scalpel and human flesh. Brain surgery is clearly a very touchy situation. Undoubtedly, anyone who needs brain surgery would want the most talented surgeons available. In the following case, the surgeons probably also wanted a talented musician. Recently, in Rome's Pedita International Hospital, a team of 10 brain surgeons worked on their 35-year-old patient as he performed various songs on his saxophone. Yes, listeners, this patient was fully awake during the nine hours of surgery. According to the surgeons, awake surgery performed with local anesthesia allows the surgeons to map with extreme precision the neuronal networks that control the various brain functions. With this particular patient, the surgeon studied the music that he would be playing prior to performing the surgery. This meant that any wrong note or too long of a pause would be recognized by the surgeons, which in turn would indicate that they need to avoid the area of the brain which they had just stimulated. Every surgery of this sort is different. Some patients will answer questions, read a book aloud, sing, or play an instrument. The surgeons try to tailor each surgery to the individual patient as much as possible. In the case of the saxophonist, his operation was difficult due to his left-handedness, which mapped his brain structure differently than a right-handed person. Thankfully, his surgery was a success, and he was able to go home to his wife and children just three days later. Although playing a saxophone while undergoing brain surgery is nothing short of miraculous, some may say it certainly is odd. This is Victoria from victoriaslift.com. When I'm not taking those who must choose their destiny for a ride on the lift, I'm listening to History Goes Bump podcast. History isn't boring, it's terrifying. The past remains with us, and so do its spirits. Can you hear them calling? They want you to know their stories. Listen now to their voices and the truth from the past. And now, this month in history. In December, on the 5th in 1492, the first Europeans arrived on the island of Hispaniola, guided by explorer Christopher Columbus. 
The island is today home to two countries known as Haiti and the Dominican Republic. It's located in the Greater Antilles, archipelago of the Caribbean Sea. The Italian explorer had originally thought he had found India or China. Columbus founded the first European settlement on the island when his flagship, the Santa Maria, sank after hitting a coral reef on Christmas Day in the same month. This occurred on the Haitian side of the island. The ship was dismantled to use the timbers for Fort Navidad, or Christmas Fort. This was built in a native Taino village. The fort was the first Spanish settlement in the New World. However, by November of the next year, when Christopher Columbus returned to the island, the fort had been burned. Later, Columbus built a settlement further east in present-day Dominican Republic and named it La Isabella, after Queen Isabella. The Blennerhazzett Hotel is the oldest hotel in West Virginia and is located in Parkersburg. The hotel was named for a couple who first settled the nearby Blennerhazzett Island. Their story is one mired in political persecution, scandal, and conspiracy. They eventually were forced to flee the area, but their name remains an imprint here. The hotel became a place for the millionaires of the time to find lodging. On opening day in 1889, the hotel featured both gas and electricity. Today, the hotel still offers elegant accommodations with modern amenities and a few ghosts. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of the Blennerhesset Hotel. This is the only state in the country that is completely in the mountains, and it's completely in the Appalachian Mountains. And this has always been a mountain range that just has a certain mystique to it. So anytime you get stories coming out of here, I'm not surprised. The area that became Parkersburg and the nearby Blannerhassett Island was first settled by an indigenous group that left behind artifacts dating to 3,000 years ago. The Delaware Nation was also here, led by Chief Nema Collin, who widened a path through the Appalachian Mountains with two of his sons to allow for westward expansion. Chief Nema Collin died on Blennerhassett Island in 1767. Settlers first came to the area after the American Revolutionary War, and they came from Virginia. They were looking to get closer to the ocean, and they named their settlement Newport. Probably because it was a new port. What do you think, Kelly? <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> The location was favorable, too, because it was at the confluence of the Ohio and Little Kanawha Rivers. The land was originally a grant to Alexander Parker for his service during the war. In 1810, the town officially was named Parkersburg, obviously for him. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad arrived in the town in 1857. During the Civil War, Parkersburg was a transportation medical center for Union forces. The late 19th century had Parkersburg transforming into a major oil refining center after an oil and gas boom. In 1883, construction on the Blannerhassett Hotel was started. This hotel was built by Colonel William Nelson Chancellor, who was a banker and eventually became mayor of Parkersburg. He had started as a bank teller and worked his way up until he was president of the local bank. Chancellor wanted to build a hotel for the rich, and he wanted it to be the best hotel in the state of West Virginia. Construction took six years to complete, and the hotel was built in the Queen Anne architectural style and stood five stories. This is a really cool looking hotel. It's still got that uh, Victorian look to it. with The tower in the front and all the Queen Anne elements. It's great. Nice. One of my favorites. Electricity came to the city in 1888 and Chancellor had the hotel wired. The electricity was generated by natural gas and the hotel also featured steam heating. No expense was spared on the interior. Fresco works were in different areas of the lobby and two companies were hired to do the window treatments. The Bentley and Gerwig Furniture Company provided all the furnishings in the hotel. Guests could get to the upper levels via an electric elevator, and there was an electric service elevator as well. There was also a central staircase in the lobby that led up all five stories. Another luxury for guests was that each of the 50 guest rooms had a private bathroom. Something that I would prefer. There you go, Kelly. If we were (laughs) back in the Victorian era, you'd have a perfect place to stay. Every floor featured public bathrooms as well. 
The second floor had a common area for people to gather with two double parlors. One of the parlors featured a piano. There was a restaurant on the second floor as well, but the kitchen was actually on the fifth floor just in case a fire started, so it would be easier for people to exit the hotel before the fire worked its way down. That was pretty smart, actually. It was. It's the first time I've ever heard of a hotel thinking about doing that. And then there is this interesting tidbit. There was a large and beautiful mirror in the lobby that had a wire cage built around it. The cage was there to protect the mirror from stray bullets. Was this an issue in Parkersburg, West Virginia? Stray bullets flying in from the street? I just laughed when I was doing the research and I saw that. I'm like, oh, it had a wire cage around the mirror. That's kind of weird. And then it said why. And I went, did they have bullets flying around the city a lot that they were worried (laughs) it was going to take the mirror out? How about all the windows in the hotel? I know. It's going to break those before it hits the mirror. It was so, so strange. I just, I was like, okay. Another unique feature of the hotel is that Chancellor had his bank inside it, and this was reached via an entrance on the corner of 4th and Market Streets. The bank remained in the hotel until the 1910s, and then the bank entrance became the hotel's main entrance. The hotel opened on May 6, 1889, but it wasn't Chancellor who ran it. He just built it. George C. Campbell leased the hotel as the first proprietor, and he is the one who named the hotel. Campbell at first wanted to name it Hotel Argyle, but then he finally landed on the Hotel Blennerhassett. This was in line with the nearby Blennerhassett Island, which was named for Harmon and Margaret Blennerhassett. Harmon was an Anglo-Irish lawyer and aristocrat who was born in England and raised in Ireland. He attended school in London and eventually joined a secret society there known as the Society of United Irishmen in 1793. This was a group that supported an Irish republic and through the years became militantly radical. An uprising was put down, and the United Kingdom Parliament at Westminster followed in its wake. Harmon married Margaret Agnew, who was his sister's daughter, which we're pretty sure makes her his niece. Kelly, of course, we talk about some of these marriages that were way back then, and we're like, wow, there's a huge age difference there, or there's that uncomfortable, the girl was 14, and the guy was between 25 and 30. This is really uncomfortable. Keeping it in the family. I guess. I mean... He's an aristocrat, so maybe they're just used to, you know, royalty. That's why a lot of them went crazy, because they were inbred. So I'm like, um, that's kind of inbreeding. Are you sure you want to have kids together? Well, this was considered in defiance of religious and societal values at the time. So this wasn't something that was just done in 1794. That makes me feel better that that wasn't a common occurrence there, that people were like, uh, hmm. Right. The following year, they immigrated to America, landing in New York City first. And I'd be willing to bet they didn't tell anybody what Probably not. kind of relationship they actually had before they got married. They moved on to Pennsylvania and then Ohio and finally settled on 174 acres on an island two miles below Parkersburg that had belonged to George Washington. They built their 7,000 square foot Blennerhassett mansion in 1798. One of the people who visited their grand home was former Vice President Aaron Burr. Harmon and Burr started working on a conspiracy to undertake a military expedition to the Southwest, where they would found a new country. In 1806, the authorities heard about the plan and decided to raid the mansion, but not before Harmon and Burr escaped down the river. Right before the bust, Margaret, who had been away, arrived home with the kids. Margaret begged the militia not to destroy the home, but it was ransacked, and Margaret ran away with the children. Eventually, Harmon and Burr were arrested, tried, and eventually freed, but not before Harmon lost all his money. The family didn't return to the island until Harmon and Margaret were buried there in 1996. Their grand mansion had burned to the ground, but the state government rebuilt it in the 1980s and turned the island into a historical state park. Margaret Blennerhassett is said to haunt the island that she loved. Her ghostly figure walks the shoreline. Some have seen her with her young daughter, who died on the island and was buried on the island. But her burial has never been located, so they're not sure exactly where she was buried, but she died while they were living there, so it's safe to assume she was probably buried there. I had no idea that Aaron Burr had been caught up in that kind of a conspiracy. Neither had I. (laughs) I did not know he was trying to start another country here in America somewhere else. William Chancellor's grandson became the next proprietor of the hotel, and he implemented the first major renovation of the hotel in 1944. The lobby floor was changed into a terrazzo one, and a marble facade was added to the outside. 
In 1960, Robert Huck became the new proprietor, and under his management, Senator John F. Kennedy stayed at the hotel while campaigning for the presidency throughout West Virginia. He stayed there twice in May of 1960 in Suite 216, which was the largest in the hotel at the time. Teddy and Bobby stayed with him on one of those visits. A banquet luncheon was held in honor of Kennedy. The Grand Hotel lost its luster in the 1970s and eventually became an apartment building for elderly people. A fire erupted in a second-floor linen closet and gutted most of the hotel, except for the fifth floor, on May 9, 1979. And I definitely found it ironic that they'd put the kitchen up on the fifth floor in case there was a fire so that it would work its way down. And that's actually the only thing that survived this fire was the fifth floor. Goodness. After the fire, the hotel sat vacant and there was real fear that eventually it would be demolished. But some Parkersburg residents joined with some investors to save the hotel and renovate it. This major renovation started in 1985 and went on for nearly a year at a cost of $7 million. A new ballroom and promenade were added to the first floor, an atrium to the third floor with skylights, a library was added, and several new guest rooms bringing that number to 104 rooms for rent. The interior was redesigned to resemble the inside of a Mississippi riverboat with dark stained wainscoting throughout, and antiques were incorporated into the decor. They also added a building to the hotel, the Kaltenecker Building, which was right next door. This building dates back to the same time as a hotel and has a similar architectural style because the same architect was used. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. The Ross family purchased the hotel in 2002. The Blennerhassett Hotel underwent another renovation beginning in 2002, and this lasted until 2006, with many of the guest rooms being turned into suites so that there now are only 89 rooms. They added a new garden patio area with a portable stage for outdoor entertainment. The hotel is now under the management of R&W Hotels, which is owned by local businessmen Wayne Waldeck and Lee Eric Rector, who bought the hotel in 2019. In 2020, they added faux tin ceilings to the library and the main lobby and promenade area of the hotel, which is a big plus in my book. I love tin ceilings. So do I. The original terrazzo lobby floor was uncovered in the library at this time as well. Two new chandeliers were hung in the lounge and main dining room areas, which came from a home located near the Versace mansion. In 2022, the hotel became the Blennerhassett Hotel and Spa. So now you know they've added a bunch of spa stuff to it. The Blennerhassett remains the oldest operating boutique hotel in the state of West Virginia, and through the years, the hotel has acquired several spirits. Like many historic hotels, the elevator in this one is haunted. Many guests claim to see a female ghost enter the elevator and then vanish. One of the people who saw this was a postman bringing a delivery. He was told to get on the elevator and go downstairs. As he approached the elevator, he saw a woman get on and he ran to catch the elevator and put his hand out to stop the doors from closing. He jumped into the elevator and realized he was all alone. There was no woman on the elevator. He later asked an employee if the hotel was haunted. Guests riding the elevator also claim to get rides they aren't expecting. Another ghost is seen at the door facing 4th Street. This too is a woman. In 1889, this had been the door to the gentleman's cigar stand and smoking room. Sherry Stevens, who was the human resource manager at the hotel, told Channel 12 that she had seen this spirit. She said, it was mid-afternoon. I was walking down the sidewalk across the street and something flashed and it made me look in the direction of the door. So I stopped for a second and I saw a woman looking right at me in the door window. Stephen said she saw the woman twice within a week. She's looked for her since then, but hasn't seen her. The woman she saw was a white woman with an expressionless face and bright red hair and wearing a light blue dress that had a frilly tall collar and a brooch. Clearly not something from our time. Many members of the staff have seen shadow figures down in the basement. These are a wide array of figures with some wearing trench coats others top hats, and some with what looks like fur coats. The main place these figures gravitate to is the laundry room. 
and they are generally seen walking to a staircase at the end of the washing machines that leads to the bellman's closet in the main lobby. Adam Dotson, who was a hospitality guest services specialist at the hotel, said he saw a shadow figure walk into his office, which was down in the basement. He was so sure that this was a real person, most likely a server in black clothing, that he went to his office to see what the employee needed, and nobody was there. The man in a bowler hat is one of the most seen ghosts at the hotel. He's seen in the dry storage area in the basement and also in room 409, which is four floors right above the storage area. This part of the hotel used to be part of the Kaltenecker building, so people think the ghost is connected to that building. Room 409 is unique in that it is the only two-story suite in the hotel. I don't think I've ever heard of a two-story suite before in a hotel. Guests report hearing the furniture moving around at night, and one woman claimed that a man in a bowler hat held her down in bed by her neck one morning. Adam Dotson had an encounter with the spirits in room 409 as well when he was staying in the room right next to the suite. This was room 407. He was awakened at night by a party going on in the suite. Dotson told the front desk about the noise and he was informed that he was the only person staying on that floor. The man who built the hotel, Colonel Chancellor, is seen usually during renovations. He is seen wearing a brown suit with a bushy mustache and monocle and looking thoughtful. He's usually on the second floor in the hallway or in guest rooms. People have reported to the front desk that they have awakened to find a man staring at them as they slept. That's creepy. Yeah, anytime you wake up and somebody's (laughs) staring at you that you don't know, that's creepy. Yeah. That's why when girls would talk about the Twilight movie and they'd be like, oh, that's so romantic that Edward would be watching Bella. And I was like, that's creepy. He's in her room (laughs) watching her while she's sleeping. Well, he's usually at the foot of the bed. I guess that's better than up by your face. That's true. (laughs) People assume he is just keeping track of how things are going in the hotel. I don't know how watching people sleeping (laughs) is related to renovations, but okay. Colonel Chancellor was fond of cigars, and the scent of cigars is often detected when he's nearby. There is no smoking in the hotel, but the library has many times been filled with the pungent smell of cigar smoke. Sometimes smoke is even seen hanging in the air. Now, that is really weird. We hear the cigar smoke smell a lot, but to actually see smoke in the air? Yeah, trust your nose picture, it may be a ghost. I know. I'm just like, how does smoke manifest itself like that? Sometimes, the cigar smell is caught wafting through the hallways as well. When people see the picture of the colonel in the hotel, they will report that he is a spirit that they have seen. And that very picture is said to be haunted, as people will see gold lights dancing around it. These have even been captured in photographs. And even stranger are people who claim to have caught a red glow on the end of the colonel's cigar in the picture. That is really weird, too. It is I want to see those pictures. <laughs> As do I. The library not only has the haunting scent of cigars, but books often get tossed about, even the old heavy books. One book in particular gets thrown a lot. So the staff has taken to putting a potted plant on it. Oh, wow. (laughs) Even this doesn't keep it from getting tossed into the walls. The whispering of female voices is heard over the intercom system, and sometimes there's even a female scream followed by laughing. That's you and I. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) We'd be like, hey, hey, how do we turn this thing on? We're going to freak these people out. Goofing around. Do some kind of blood curling scream. And then we'd be like, ha, 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 ha. Flapper style music is heard coming from the Charleston room, which is appropriate, I would say. And the other ballrooms have music coming out of them as well. The chandelier also swings on its own in the Charleston room, and silverware occasionally goes flying. Watch it for those butter knives. There is also the spirit of a little boy here. He is dressed in clothing from the 1920s and looks to be about nine years old. A chef saw him standing in the kitchen one night. He did a double take, and when he looked back, the child was gone. This boy also has been seen down in the basement near the staff lounge. He always disappears right after he is spotted. And he's not the only child here because security staff have claimed to hear the disembodied singing of children. One of them said that they heard this phantom group of children singing Jingle Bells at Christmas time. Also on the second floor, ghostly children play tag in the hall. And a bellman said he saw a little girl in a fancy dress on that floor out of the corner of his eye. But when he turned to look at her, she disappeared around a corner. The list of ghosts in this place, Kelly, it just goes on and on. 
A phantom maid has been seen scrubbing the floor in the lobby wearing a uniform from another era. There's the four o'clock knocker who haunts the coffee shop that's located where the front desk used to be. This spirit raps on the wall near the doorway into the office at 4 a.m., which is why it's called the four o'clock knocker. There are usually three loud raps. There's the kissing bandit who likes to give female guests little kisses on their faces and lips as they sleep. These women awaken, sit up, and then the kissing stops and they're shocked to find that they are all alone in their room. But thankfully they are because if I was getting a bunch of little kisses and I wake up and I'm not supposed to have somebody in my room and they're there, not good. The red room gives people a feeling of dread and the doors open and close on their own. People feel like they're being watched here as well. Another guest reported that he had been awakened in the middle of the night by something depressing the bed as if someone unseen had just sat down. He glanced at the foot of the bed and saw an old man sitting there who, upon realizing that he had been seen, scowled and said, I was here first. I'd be like, <laughs> okay, you can have the bed. I'm out. Get off my bed. <laughs> like, get off my lawn. <laughs> oh, man. The spirit then faded away. The guest promptly packed his bag and checked out. Happy to leave the old spirit in the room he apparently was possessive of. And then finally, there are the haunted mirrors. The Blenner Hassett purchased two large and fancy mirrors that had been made from two mirrored door casings from a Victorian-era building that was going to be demolished in New York City. The mirrored doors dated to the Victorian era. The mirrors were put in the bar, and one evening, several bar patrons saw the reflection of a man in a 1920s-style white tuxedo. When they turned to see the man in the tuxedo, they realized that there was no man in the bar wearing those clothes. And I would have done the same thing. If I saw some guy wearing an old tuxedo, I would have turned around quick going, what in the world? The other mirror has reflected the image of a sea captain who looked almost to be in black and white except for his shiny brass buttons. Wow, that is interesting. And I find it interesting that both of the mirrors are reflecting two different images. And this kind of goes along the lines of, well, we'll talk about it in a moment, but we were talking about mirrors on a bonus episode that we did. Yeah, a redux. There are a large number of spirits hanging around this hotel, and nobody knows exactly why, other than that the hotel has been here a long time and hosted a lot of history. The hotel hosts its own ghost tours and spirit sessions. Is the Blennerhassett Hotel haunted? That That is for for you to to decide. decide. This looks like a really cool hotel to check out. In West Virginia. I would love to. I mean, I can't believe that it has so many different spirits here. And like we said there in the ending, I don't know why. It's not like, well, this had been a Civil War hospital or something else. Even when it was the old people's apartment building, I don't know that a whole bunch of them passed away there. And then all these children and stuff. I'm like, is there some history here about this building that we don't know? Because why is it so full of spirits? It's very interesting to be sure. The Appalachian Paracon is going to be hosted at the hotel in March of 2023, and we do have a link in the show notes for that if you would like to go check it out. They've got a lot of interesting speakers that are going to be there, it looks like. I want to save our pennies and nickels and we can go check it out. (laughs) Yeah, we just can't do it this March because we have something else that is kind of big on our plate, so (laughs) we won't be doing it then. We'd love to have you guys check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you'd like to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. We heard from Angela. She said, oh, my God, I've been searching for a podcast about history and haunts, and I accidentally came upon you all. And that's what we hear a lot. People just kind of stumble across our show on different apps and such. But this one's a little different. I'm fascinated with haunted woods and Bigfoot sightings. I've been listening to Expanded Perspectives for over a year, and I love them, too. So anyway, I bought a new car weeks ago, and it has Apple CarPlay in it. I've never had that, for your information. It was a week after Halloween, and I was pushing buttons and scrolling through. Getting familiar with this in my car, and I have no idea how, but your podcast icon popped up, and it was your Halloween episode of this year. How crazy is that? Girls, I have searched and searched for a podcast like this and never could find it. Thank you, witches, ghosts, or whatever, for finding y'all for me. Now I have over 400 episodes to listen to, and this makes me overexcited. Yay, I'm so glad to hear. I just love that, especially because we didn't have to pay for that marketing. (laughs) Well, this is true. (laughs) But now I'm like, should we be having seances for marketing? Oh, my word. (laughs) Get those ghosts or witches or whatever to put our podcasts up on people's apps or whatever. (laughs) We just said, who knew the universe or creepies were helping us get out the show? We'll take whatever help we can get. If you guys love the show, make sure you're sharing it as well. Yes, please. And we'd love to have your support for the show. 
We just put a new redux up, as we were mentioning a little bit ago. This is the Legend of Bloody Mary redux. So we went back over the episode that we'd done on Mary, and we updated it with some new experiences that people have had. It's definitely one you don't want to listen to without the lights on. (laughs) Might be a little too creepy for some. Yeah. And you may not want to be hanging around mirrors too much, because we talk about a lot of stuff with mirrors and hauntings and that kind of thing. Plus, you'll also be a part of the Christmas mailing, and we're going to be getting those magnets in the mail. I can't wait to see them. I think they are going to turn out great. I'm excited as well, and I can't wait to stuff those envelopes. And write all those addresses out. (laughs) Well, you know, personal touch and all. I know. We want to make sure everybody knows that we love them individually. Nobody's just a number to us. This is true. I want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode isn't brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to welcome into the cemetery, Melissa Stott. You're going to be placed in a chest tomb. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. We really appreciate it. Check out the website at historygoesbump.com. The hotel, hotel, the hotel. hotel, it's a hotel. Electricity came to the city in 1888 and the chancellor had it. Nope. And the chancellor had it hot wired is what I was going to say. <laughs> Chan- <laughs> the chancellor had it hot wired, hot wired the hotel. <laughs> Did he drive it somewhere? Maybe. Room. <laughs> All right. Electricity came to the city in 1888 and chancellor had the hotel. I almost said hot wired again. (laughs) (laughs) Guests could get to the upper. After the fire, the hotel sat vacant. Vacant. (laughs) Vacant. Many guests claim to see a female ghost under the elevator. Well, if she's under the elevator, we know why she's a ghost. (laughs) (laughs) The guests promptly papped. The guest promptly packed a... Too many peas. The guest promptly pooped. <laughs> he, might, he might I, have, but he didn't report that, I'm sure. I can't even read it when there's two peas in this thing, and yet I use alliteration in the oddities all the time. <laughs> and I just keep going with it. The guest then changed his drawers, <laughs> packed his bags, and left. I'm, next time I come here, I'm wearing the pens. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.